going to continue where we left off last time. Last time okay. I spoke about a renewal. Do you remember what a mm. renewal is? Um, yes, it's when your um, it's your renewal period for your insurance that's about to expire. Correct. And what does that actually tell us? Mm. It tells us that there needs to be further underwriting, perhaps. Okay. Because okay, what happens every time there's a renewal? There's an advanced listing. Yes. And the advanced listing does what? It tells the insurer that they need to go back to the client to do um, a needs analysis or to check if the risks are still as what they are. Okay. Okay. So when looking at the renewal, the renewal always arises when the contract is about to expire because we're looking at short-term insurance. Okay, remember short-term insurance, there's no automatic renewal. There can be, but in most cases, those contracts need to be renewed. They need to be, let's say, re-signed and agreed on going forward. So can things change? Yes, things can change. Things can change. Okay, so risk is always something that we need to consider. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so now in this module, Study Unit 6, we're focusing on this concept reinsurance. We were introduced to reinsurance in the first study unit. Do you remember what reinsurance is? Um, yes, I think so. It's when the insurer takes out further insurance. Okay, well, it's not that they're taking out further insurance. What are they doing? They're covering themselves. And how do they do that? Um... You're right. Do they transfer or retain? Just uh, picture those diagrams. Yes. What do they do? I think they transfer. Correct, they transfer. Okay, so reinsurance is a way for an insurer to transfer risk to another party. That's the main reason why we've got it. Okay. Okay. So the learning outcomes for this module will describe what reinsurance is. Okay, we'll look at it in more detail. We'll discuss who a sedent is. Okay, um, we'll look at a bit of law there. So sessionary, okay, or, or session, the law of session. Okay, we'll look at the difference between treaty and, and facultative insurance. That's a popular one. They always okay. test that. It's um, in some questions in terms of long or short. It all depends. They look at treaty reinsurance versus faculty reinsurance. They are quite different, but they're similar as well. Okay. We'll look at proportional reinsurance. There are some calculations in this module. So. We haven't looked at any before until now. Mm. The only calculate, or let's say inverted commas calculation that we've looked at was the difference between a franchise and an excess. And that wasn't much of a calculation. That was just looking at what does the actual insurer cover in the event of loss. Yeah. Here we're going to be focusing on, on, on some workings, okay, where we're going to look at different types of um, treaties. Okay, so a nine line or five line treaty We'll look at quota shares. Okay, so how do we actually share the burden in terms of covering loss between the reinsurer and the insurer? We'll look at the different treaties, which I just spoke about. Okay, surplus treaties will calculate the placement. Okay, so how much business can you place with a particular insurer? We'll okay. distinguish between proportional and non-proportional, and then we'll look at a stop-loss reinsurance type of situation as well. An excess of loss and a catastrophe excess of loss. So you get different types of reinsurance and we'll describe why. Okay, we'll look at their role in more detail. And then layering is something to consider uh, when looking at reinsurance because you're placing business with another provider. Okay, so you're the insurer and you've got inverted commas big brother or sister helping you with the actual writing of new business. And then the last bit is the disadvantages and advantages. Okay, we'll focus more on the advantages when looking at reinsurance. Right, so to start off, you've described it, okay? What is reinsurance? Mm. What did we say? We said it was? Uh, it transferred risk to another party. Correct, okay, so taking risk from the insurer mm. and transferring it to a reinsurer. Why would we do something like that? To cover ourselves in case yes. of... Okay, to help eliminate some of the risk from those clients. And also to help write more business. Okay, so if you've got a reinsurer, 
if a reinsurer is taking the insurer's risk, how big do you think the reinsurer needs to be? Really big. Well, bigger. Yeah, in terms of yeah. size. Yeah. So another reason why you would want reinsurance is a way to grow a small business if you're in the insurance industry. Okay, because as the insurer, are you going to be able to write massive contracts? Um, Probably yes, not. Yes, you would, but you... Okay. Okay, you'd be limited as well in terms of the amount yeah. of contracts you could write. Yes. Okay, so if you've got the support from a reinsurer, it's a win-win situation because you get to transfer some of the risk and you get to write more business, which helps the reinsurer to also raise their profits. Okay. Because what did we say is in... What, what's the purpose of insurance? Remember we defined what insurance was, we spoke about what it is, so... How would you describe the business sense of it? Or how does the insurance business work? Um, Let's say if someone didn't know what insurance was, how would you explain it to them, Melanie? Uh, insurance is a way to um, eliminate risk and to cover losses. Yes. Okay, so how does the insurance industry work? How do you mm. cover those risks? Uh, you would claim for your losses. Yes. And, and, you would be, and you would be reimbursed for that loss. Okay. Obviously with terms and conditions that apply. Okay. So does the insurer, okay, write business with many or few? Many. Many. Okay. So there's that whole concept of pooling again, hey? Yes. Okay, so insurance is about pooling risks, similar types of risks. So we know people can be in car accidents. Not everyone will be in a car accident. Yes. Can we write a product then? Yes. Yes, you okay, can. Okay, we can write a product called car insurance. Yes. All right, so similar types of risks are grouped in certain products because we need to have insurable risk and it needs to be based on probability. Okay, so the chances are, what are the chances of being in an accident? What are the chances of dying? What are the chances of getting a specific um, illness? What are the chances of um, burglary at the business? And so on. Okay, so it's based on chance, it's based on probability, and it's based on providing peace of mind to the end consumer. Okay, so if we offer car insurance to someone who's driving a vehicle, that gives them peace of mind, okay, because you're taking on the risk if something should happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why would insurers consider reinsurance? We spoke about it. Two factors would be? Um, two, um, two factors. To transfer the risk. Definitely, that's the one. That's that's one of the main reasons. What else? Um, More business, right? More business, yeah. I was just okay. going to say that. Yeah. All right, so transferring risk looks at, I'm not comfortable with the amount of exposure we have to certain, let's say, drivers, okay, in terms of how much um, drivers we have as part of the car insurance product okay you might then say well can I find a reinsurer would help which would help us reduce our exposure to that particular risk okay so transferring is trying to reduce their exposure to a particular risk and another would be the business side of things it makes business sense okay to approach a reinsurer because you can help write more business and you might be able to write bigger business as well Okay, so as a small insurer, you might not be able to cover very large risks. But now, because you have the support of a reinsurer, you can write much bigger contracts for different policies. Okay. Okay, there are other reasons as well. Okay, in terms of support, perhaps, maybe growth and other reasons as well. But the main would be definitely transferring your risk and then writing more business as well. All right, so this is what we've got. Reinsurers helping the insurer, which is ultimately covering the insured. Insure. Okay, so who would be the cedent? Okay, we're looking at insurer, right? Seeding yeah. company. Okay, so seeding means giving or transferring 
part of all of the risks to other companies. Okay? Sedent okay. and then the sessionary. Okay, you've got two different roles. Okay. Alright, so you, you've probably covered that a bit in law. Yes. Okay, so that might have been a while back when you did do the law yeah. module. Okay, we'll revisit and we'll discuss those in detail again. Okay, it'll come up later in an example. Okay, but we need to know what the role is. Okay, if I'm giving up risk, okay, where does the risk go? Up or down? It would go up. It would go up, yes. It starts with the insured and the risk is transferred to the insurer. And then from the insurer, it can be transferred to a reinsurer. Okay, so that's the level in terms of risk being transferred. So one transferring it to another, transferring it to another. In terms of the actual payout, in terms of loss, how would losses be paid out? Top down, right? Yes. Okay, so here, a portion of the loss can be paid to the insurer, which then gets paid to the insured. Okay, so do you see how reinsurance helps the insurer so much? Yes. Because they're in the middle. It's nice to be in the middle, isn't it? It is. <laughs> because you've got support from the top, okay, and you transfer some of the problems above. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's like being middle management. Okay, yes, it might be stressful being in middle management because you need to manage the relationships from the senior guys and in the junior guys. But if you're middle management, you're just in the middle. Okay, so normally the top guys are complaining about the bottom guys. And then you've got to facilitate and, and try to solve yeah. the problem. Right, or yeah. the bottom guys are complaining about the top guys. And then you're just in the middle um, trying to navigate that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm looking at an insurer, that's exactly what they are. They're in the middle. They're like middle management. Okay, because if they have problems... Who do they go to? They go to the reinsurer, and the reinsurer helps them to solve those problems by covering some of their losses. Mm -hmm. Okay, or to write more business. Okay, and then the insurer is obviously going to provide a product to the insured. Okay, so as the insurer, you would want to provide a better product to your insured by offering them more peace of mind. Okay, having, um, let's say, greater capability of meeting your requirements okay, as, as, as an insurer. All right, so reasons for insurers to transfer risk. I asked you for a few earlier. Here are the ones that they discuss in the textbook and the study guide. Okay, Reinsurance allows the seeding company to accept further risk. What does that point refer to? Writing more business. Okay, mm -hmm. because who is the seeding company? The insurer. insurer. Okay, the insurer is the seeding company because they're seeding some of their risk to the reinsurer. Mm. Okay, more stable profits and evens are losses. We spoke about that. That's transferring the risk, but also the reward. So what benefit does the reinsurer get for having written more business with the insurer? Commission. Yes, they share in the profit. They share in the premium. Okay, they would earn some form of premium as being part of that um, um, process. Okay, covering risks of the insured. Okay, then we've got reducing the seeding company's reserve requirements. Okay, we'll talk about reserve requirements in more detail later. Okay, for now, what is a reserve? Um, it's something that you'd like um, that you'd have kept aside to do like all your funds. Uh, in case of losses. Correct. Good. To pay out certain losses. Right. So do you agree? If I'm writing, let's say, car insurance, okay, and this is the fund, okay, and the fund has a hundred, okay, mm -hmm. do you agree we will have a portion of that that will be paid out towards all the car accidents? Yes. Okay. So if I've got a seeding company, okay, Giving or transferring risk from the insurer to the reinsurer, uh, reinsurer in terms of reinsurance, okay, we're reducing the seeding company's reserve requirements, meaning the company writing the business isn't going to have to keep as much capital 
on hand to pay for that portion of loss because the reinsurer is helping to pay out some of the loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that a benefit to the business? Yes. Yes, it would be. Okay, and then the last is to reduce reducing the underwriting requirements. Okay, because underwriting can be very time consuming and very costly as well. So the reinsurer can help with that process by offering maybe services in that area where they could help with the underwriting. Okay, so they don't need to. Uh, and also, if you think about it, if you're transferring risk to someone else, you're not going to be as worried as you were before. So you might no. not have to do as much underwriting as you would have before. Because think about it, if you're keeping the risk, are you gonna underwrite it very well? Or uh, let's say, are you gonna do very detailed underwriting? Yes. Yes, you would. But if you know you're gonna be transferring this to someone else and they're helping you to support the losses, well then you might be a bit more lenient in terms of the underwriting process where you might be willing to take on more clients rather than less. Yes. Okay. And then we've got two different types. Okay, so classes of reinsurance, you do need to know what the differences are. Okay, so proportional and participating versus non-proportional and non-participating. When looking at proportional, think about a portion. What is a portion? It's not the entire value, it's a percentage. Exactly, yeah. It's a part of, it's a percentage of, exactly, good. So a reinsurer pays a fixed percentage of the claims. Okay, and that's proportional, meaning if the insurer takes 50%, the reinsurer would take 50%. And that can be either treaty or facultative. Okay, we need to discuss what that means later. Okay, okay. but that's proportional. So proportional always a fixed percentage. If it's non-proportional, well then the reinsurer might pay for more or they might pay for less depending on an agreed amount. Okay, so losses could only be paid out if it exceeds a specific amount. Okay, so example could be, um, let's say we've got an insurer, okay, and the loss is one million. Right, any loss above a million will be covered by the reinsurer. They will help with the actual loss. So if it's greater than a million, then the reinsurer would assist with that payout. And that's non-proportional because they don't pay out a percentage of all the losses. So if I had a loss of 500,000, would the reinsurer pay anything? No. They wouldn't pay anything if it's non-proportional, but they would have to pay if it's proportional. It's a, fi it's a fixed percentage of. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Great. All right, so here's a note about proportional. Okay, so remember what side am I looking at? I'm looking at the left. I'm building on the side where I'm looking at the proportional insurance. Okay, so proportional reinsurance is when we contribute a percentage of the losses. So if I'm, if I'm apportioning a percentage of the loss, surely the risk then is split. Yes. Yes, okay, between the cedent and the reinsurer. Who's the cedent? Um, the the insurer. is the person ceding the risk. Okay. So who's it? The insurer. Correct. Good. The insurer would be classified as the cedent because they're giving or they're ceding some of their risk okay, to the reinsurer. Right, so the parties are bound by an agreement and it's always predetermined okay, in terms of a fixed share of the risk because we're looking at proportional reinsurance. Okay, if it's proportional, we, we know what the definition is. It's a split of, <coughs> it's a percentage of. All right, so how does it work? Well, there's a sharing of the premium. Okay, obviously the reinsurer is not going to take on your risk without having a share of the premium, right? Premium. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the premium is collected and it's shared in the same proportion. So you share the risks the same as you would share the premium. Okay, so the benefit and the cost, or the, uh, let's say the benefit and the cost is in line with the reward. Okay, so if you're sharing risk 50-50, well then you would share the premium 50-50. Okay. Okay. Treaty or facultative, those are two types of reinsurance. The first, think of a treaty. When you think of the word treaty, what are you thinking about? 
it's like an agreement. Yes. Okay. So a treaty is like when when people are fighting, and then uh, normally you hear about treaties during like world wars. World wars. Yeah. Like if you think back to history. Okay, if you did study yeah. history, you would have covered some of that in terms of the different treaties, treaty for this, treaty for that. Yes. Okay, so a treaty is exactly that. It's, it's in a way, it's a way to agree or to accept, okay, businesses that will be placed with the reinsurance. Okay, with the reinsurer. So if you have a treaty, okay, can you place business with the reinsurer? Yes, because yes. they must accept. It's a treaty. You guys have agreed it agreed on it okay it's an agreement that's in place okay so a treaty means there's no questions asked if you have a treaty with the reinsurer as the insurer you can place business with the reinsurer because that treaty exists between the two role players mm -hmm. is that right okay. yes okay facultative is when it needs to be negotiated okay so it's not it's not set in stone okay a treaty is set in stone we follow the treaty we follow the rules we place business okay we share risks we share reward okay facultative is when each risk needs to be negotiated before it's accepted okay so if it's facultative there's room for negotiation the reinsurer may or may not cover that risk Okay. That's the big difference between the two. Okay, so treaty, there's always an agreed, um, let's say, contract in place where you can place business. Facultative, there isn't. Each risk is negotiated before being accepted. But the reinsurer has a relationship with the insurer when there's a treaty or facultative form of reinsurance between the two parties. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. here's some calculations. Okay. We're looking at a quota share. So if you think about a quota share, we're focusing on what? Quota meaning? Mm. It's like a percentage. Yes. Okay. Filling your quota. Filling the, your percentage. Correct. All right. So the cedents are bound to cede risk to the reinsurer. Okay. Who's the cedent? The insurer. The insurer, always. Okay, remember that. Okay, because that's their role. They're ceding the risk to the reinsurer. Sure. Okay, so the cedent is bound to cede risk to the reinsurer, and the reinsurer must accept a fixed portion. Why? What type of reinsurance is this? What type of reinsurance? Um, treaty. Treaty. If it's treaty, it must be accepted. Okay. Okay, facultative, it can be negotiated. Right, so what type of reinsurance here? Treaty. Then, under treaty, you've got quota share and you've got others. So the first is quota share. If it's a quota share treaty, then there's going to be a percentage share between the two parties. Okay, remember Big Brother helping the ins insurer. Okay, so the example here is, there's a 70-30 split in terms of a quota share treaty. What is the session and what is the retention? Retention is what we keep, session is what we give. Okay. So are we giving 70 or keeping 70? 70, 30. We're keeping 70 and giving 30. Okay, we're keeping 30 and we're ceding 70. Okay, Okay, because who's more important, the reinsurer or the insurer? I think the reinsurer. Yeah, the reinsurer, because they're at the top. They're helping the little insurer to write more business. Okay, <clears throat> so the focus is always from the reinsurer's perspective. Okay, so if it's 70, 30, the session is 70 and the retention is 30. Okay, because remember, what's the whole purpose of reinsurance? It's to eliminate risk for the insurer. Yes. Okay, so how much risk does the insurer still have? 30. Only 30%. Okay, but they could have written business that would have been, let's assume, let's assume the business they wrote was a billion rand. Okay, that's a lot for one insurer to have as a loss. 
Okay, as a potential yeah. loss. So what can they do? They split it. So now if they split it, 70 goes to the reinsurer the and 30 goes to the insurer. insurer. So now you've written a contract for a $1 billion loss, okay? But it's split between you and the reinsurer. So you're giving away 700 million or 70, uh, how much is a billion? A billion is a million million, right? So yes. um, how many zeros is that? It's, it's, it's 700, About. right? And then yeah. 300, 300 million. Yes. Okay, which, make, which makes up the billion, right? Yes. Okay, so what the company has actually done is they've written business to the value of a billion, but they're only keeping 300 million as a loss. So if that smaller insurer can cover those losses, well, then that's great. Okay, but do you agree if they wouldn't, they never would have been able to, writ to write this contract? That yes. insurer would never have been able to write a billion dollar in biz a billion rand in business, okay, if they were just on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay, but because they have the treaty, all right, it allows them to write more business because it's a percentage of. Okay. Okay. So what happens with premiums and losses then? Well, let's check. Okay. If a premium of five thousand is collected monthly, okay, and the claim is 500,000. Who pays what? The reinsurer. What does the reinsurer receive and what does the reinsurer pay? Okay. Remember, we're looking at 7030 in this example. Quota okay. share treaty. Do you have an amount or an answer? Um, in a minute. Okay. Okay, so uh, the reinsurer will receive 3500 Of what? Of the premium, uh, right? Of the premium, yes. And pays what? Um, 350000 Okay, good. Okay, so notice how you applied the 70% 70, 70 here to the 5,000 and the 500,000 because the reinsurer's share, remember it's a quota share treaty. So yes. it doesn't matter how big the claim is, must they mm -hmm. pay a portion of it? Uh, yes. Correct. Seven. Why? Yes. It's because it's a treaty, it's not facultative. Yes. Okay, good. And then the cedent, which is who? Um, the seated is the insurer. Correct. He will re receive 1500 of the premium and he will pay 150000 of the loss. Correct. Good. Okay, so that's an example looking at a quota share treaty. Okay, remember it's always a percentage of. Right, it's a mm -hmm. split between the two businesses. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Great. All right, so just another note about the quota share treaty. A monetary limit will apply. Okay because it reduces exposure and cedents must have financial interest in the risk. Okay, those are two things that we need to comply with. So if we're writing business, obviously the cedent must have financial interest in the risk, meaning they can't write business for the reinsurer without keeping a portion of it in terms of the risk and without keeping a portion of the premium. Right, it's restricted. Okay, there has to be a specific amount of financial interest in that risk that they're writing. Okay, so you okay. can't just write risk and then not have any, um, let's say, cover for it. Alright, so advantages, okay. no selection, sharing in all the accounts. Alright, so why do we have no selection? Because everything is shared equally, it's a percentage of. Right, so can you choose which clients you want to underwrite and which clients you don't? Mm, I'm sure you can, but wouldn't that be unfair? <laughs> okay, it wouldn't be part of this type of agreement. Okay, okay, no selection. Okay, no selection means, okay, if you write a, a contract for a client, okay, and, and you've got a quota share treaty, it's going to be split between both. Okay, okay. reinsurer and insurer. Okay, because do you agree as the insurer, what would you like to do? 
as the insurer you would like to take the bad clients okay and give them to the reinsurer right yes okay because that would be ideal as the insurer can you do that here no selection oh. sharing in all the accounts okay that's an advantage to the reinsurer because there's no bias here in terms of which clients or um big clients or small clients it doesn't matter it's just an amount it's just a risk and the cover okay okay great potential profit as business is shared we spoke about that being able to write bigger business is the biggest incentive for a smaller insurer to have a reinsurer Okay, disadvantages, the seeded must seed business to the reinsurer. That's the disadvantage. They can't keep business because they've got a treaty in, in, um, in place. If they've got a treaty in place, business is seeded to the reinsurer. And another disadvantage is only risks within the treaty can be seeded. Okay, so you can't seed any other risks that aren't covered. It's only risks that are covered. Okay, so as, a, as an insurer, okay, does that create a problem? Yes, yes, because you can't always seed all your risks. Some risks you are going to have to keep. Okay. Okay. All right, then we've got a note here about a surplus treaty. So notice not quota share, surplus. If it's a treaty, do they still share a portion of? Um, yes. Yes, they do. Okay, but if it's a surplus treaty, meaning only the amount of excess for a particular risk is seeded, to the reinsurers and not a fixed proportion. Okay, so this is a scenario where you're looking at getting assistance when there is bigger, let's say, contracts to be written. Okay, so smaller contracts you keep for the business, larger contracts you then see to the reinsurer. Okay, so are all areas of business equally risky? No, because Different businesses will have different risks. Exactly. Okay, so think about office block versus factory. All right, so Melanie, you're working at the manufacturer of radiators for uh, yes. a German company you mentioned before. So yes. do you sit at the office block or at the factory? The office block. The office blo block. So in terms of risk, are there as many risks where you are versus where the factory is? No, there's very minimal risk. There's more m risks at the factory. Correct. Good. Yeah. So the factory has more risks in terms of fire, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Or damages or a machine failure and whatever else. Okay. Explosions yep. even maybe. Things like that. Yes. Okay. Good. Right. So insurers will have a maximum retention for specific risks. Why? Insurers have a limit to the amount that they can retain. Do you agree? Yes. And over and above that amount, they need someone to help. Yes. All right. So that's where we get these things. We get a five line and a nine line treaty. Okay. Reinsurers share, okay, which is the five or nine line treaty. The insurers reduced retention. And there's a capacity or, an, uh, or exclusion that can apply. All right. So when look at a five or nine line treaty, it's looking at this, the surplus treaty, right? How much is the insurer going to take in terms of the excess? Okay, only the amount of excess will be covered by the reinsurer. Okay, so a portion sits with the company, with the insurer, and only the amount exceeding a certain amount would be given to the reinsurer. That's why it's called surplus. Surplus meaning the additional amount, the extra amount. Okay. Okay, so here's two examples. Right, example A and example B. Okay, the first one, insurer has a total sum insured of 2.5 million. Okay, who is that? That's the insurer. Do you agree? Sure. Yes. They're looking at a net line. Okay, so a net line is 200,000 and a line line and a nine line treaty exists. So what is the gross capacity? Gross meaning? Everything, all of it. Everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I've got a net line of 200, how many additional lines do I have? Nine. Nine. So the base is 200 and you've got nine lines. So it's 2 million. Okay. It's 200 plus 
nine lines of 200. Okay, okay. so that's what you, you've got. A net line of 200 and a nine line treaty amounts to a gross capacity of 2 million. Okay, gross capacity meaning what? What the company would be Everything able to write as business when a nine line treaty exists. Okay. Okay. okay, let's look at B. The insurer has a total sum insured of 2.5, okay? Mm -hmm. But now the net line is 600,000 and this is a five line treaty. So what's the gross capacity? It will be the 600,000. Yes. Plus five times the 600,000. Which is how much? Um, calculate speed quickly. Is it 3.6 million? Correct, million. yes. Okay, so that's the gross capacity. Gross capacity meaning what you could write as business. Okay, <clears throat> if I look at A and B, <clears throat> A and B, the, the insurer has a total sum insured. So what is this? This is what? The business. Business. Okay, that's the business. All right, so here there's gross capacity. So. Can they write 2.5 million as, as business? Yes. Yes. Can this, can company A write 2.5 million business? No. How much can they write? Mm -hmm. 2 million. 2 million. Okay. So what happens with the other half, half a million? Mm. Does it get transferred? No. Remember, it's limited to the treaty. Okay. So the surplus treaty, meaning that the nine and five line treaty exists, but only for a gross capacity of two million. So this insurer can only write business of two million. If there's 500,000 left over, this isn't part of the treaty. It now becomes part of the facultative. Okay, because okay, what is facultative? It's negotiated. All right, so should the reinsurer want to ex uh, accept more risk, it would have to be negotiated separately as part of a facultative agreement. Okay. Okay, so the surplus treaty is looking at your exposure in terms of how much business can the company write based on the five or nine line treaty. Okay. 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 All right, non-proportional, which is the other side. Okay, so we're looking at non-proportional. We're focusing on... An unequal amount. Okay, so cedents will bear losses up to a specific amount before the re before reinsuring the balance above the amount. Okay, this is greater in terms of popularity. Why? Because it's a lot more simple. Okay, there's no uh, there's no need to apportion it um, equally. There's no need to share it equally, and it's also less expensive. Okay, because think about it from the reinsurer's point of view. Okay, when are they going to start accepting losses? only if it exceeds a certain amount right yes okay and as an insurer do you agree you can write business for yourself and then if you're writing bigger contracts then you can only use the insurer mm -hmm. okay so it also helps to keep some of the profit with within the insurer okay rather than extending it to the reinsurer okay so you get two types or three types actually of non-proportional insurance non-proportional meaning it's not split evenly. Okay, so there's stop loss, there's excess of loss, and there's catastrophe excess of loss. Those are the three different forms of what type of insurance? Non-proportional. Okay, so what were the two types of insurance for, pro 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 uh, for proportional? Um, proportional quota share uh, and surplus treaty. Hey, surplus quota treaty, shares? yes. Yeah, quota yes. share and surplus. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so here's an example. We need to first describe what a stop loss is though. Okay, so you've probably heard of a stop loss before. It's talked about in investments as well. Okay, where you're trying to cap the losses that you can sustain, right? Yeah. Okay, so the same thing applies when thinking about insurance. Okay, preventing certain business areas or classes of insurance from reaching unacceptably high levels of risk. Okay, so you could have, so for example, um, um, maybe like hail damage. 
Okay, hell damage can probably be sustained by the insurer themselves. Okay, okay. but should the damage be severe? Let's say the hailstorm severely affects your customers, your customers' vehicles, and many of their vehicles are damaged. Okay, you might want to consider non-proportional reinsurance because if a very bad storm happens and all your clients are affected, the damages are going to be massive. Mm -hmm. And then the excess is going to then be covered by the reinsurer. So it's like a way to cap your losses in terms of your exposure. Okay, stop loss, non-proportional reinsurance contract. Okay. Okay, so the example here, a stop loss treaty exists for 80% of an excess of claims over 75% of the premiums. Okay, so this is the treaty that's being created. Okay, if it's a treaty, what does that mean? Set in stone. Yes, okay, it's something that has been agreed on. Okay, but it's an agreed on, it's an agreed on contract for non-proportional reinsurance. Okay. okay, so an insurer has 10 million in premium income and 9 million in claims, okay? Will the stop loss come into effect? Well, we need to determine what is 80% of the excess of claims over the 75% of premiums. Okay, so what is 75% of the premiums? Uh, seven, it'll be 75% of 100, I mean 10 million. Yes, which is? Uh, 750,000. No. no. Uh, okay, let me calculate that. Uh, 750,000. No, 7.5 million. It's 75%. 3 quarters of 10 million. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, so 3 quarters of 10 million would be 7.5 million. million yeah. Okay, that would be 75% of the premium. What is 80% of the excess? So what is the excess? The excess would be your claim, which is the 9 million. 9 million, yeah. Okay, so the excess is that. There's it. Okay. Okay, and then 75% of the 10 million is 7.5, so the excess that's claimed is the 1.5 million. But it's a stop loss treaty, so only 80% of the excess is covered by the, re by the reinsurer. Okay, so the stop loss pays. 1.2 million, which is 80% of the excess of 75% of the premiums. Okay. Okay. So notice how the reinsurer can place a limit on the losses. Because does mm. the reinsurer want to take too much of the loss? No. No. Okay, so the reinsurer also needs to protect themselves from taking on too much of the risk. Yes. Okay, so in this scenario, Okay, if there was a 10 million rand worth of premium income, okay, and a 9 million rand in claims, all right, the difference would be what the stop loss treaty would provide for in terms of cover from the reinsurer. So the, re the reinsurer would cover how much of the losses? Okay. 1.2 million. That's how much the stop loss would pay. It would pay 80% of the excess over the claims. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, so yeah, just make sure you've got the calculation, you've got the working, okay, because it's always a percentage of, and they need to give you the specific detail, because in an exam or in, a, uh, in an assignment, you're never going to know what the actual percentages are unless they tell you. Okay, so they must give you the information in order for you to work it out. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Great. Okay, and then we've got the other two, excess of loss and catastrophe excess of loss. They're quite similar. Okay, the first is looking at excess of loss, meaning the reinsurance specific for individual risks. Okay, so individual meaning, uh, let's say like cars or hail damage or something specific. Okay, so if it's an okay. excess of loss, it'll only be a, a, above a specific amount. Okay, reinsurance specific for the individual risks. Okay, excess of loss for a specific risk. Catastrophe, excess of loss, is looking at catastrophic, ca catastrophic events that could cause serious financial difficulties for the insurer. Okay, so does the insurer ever want to sit with earthquake damage? No. Okay, definitely not. Right, but if that's something that they're willing to cover, if there's a catastrophe, if there's a catastrophe, uh, 
if there's a catastrophic event that can occur and create serious damage in terms of loss, there could be different layers that will be provided to cover the losses based on past experience. Okay, so there you're looking at layers. So layer one, layer two, layer three. Okay, a range of exposure. All right, so meaning the reinsurer would assist with catastrophic losses that exceed what the current insurer is able to sustain. Okay, okay it's, it's catastrophic. Okay, meaning very, very, very big losses. Okay, will be assisted um, in terms of the reinsurer providing help with covering those losses. Okay. okay. And that's it for this section. Right, so I want to quickly give you some examples and then we'll take a quick five minute breather just to uh, pause so I can um, create the, the next video and then um, we'll look at the next section, okay, which is study unit four. Okay, well, study unit seven, part of support material four. I will look at the claims procedure. Okay, um, the examples I wanted to show you here. Okay, all right, so Munich RE takes number one spot in the top 15 global reinsurers. Okay, so... What is a reinsurer? Mm, when you transfer your risk. Yes. Okay, so uh -huh. Munich RE. Okay, I want to talk about some of the biggest reinsurers in the world. Okay, Munich mm -hmm. RE took number one spot in the top 15 global reinsurers according to the rankings. Okay, um, this was in 2015. This was an article from 2015. Okay, Munich RE are still one of the biggest reinsurers in the world okay is it better to be the reinsurer or the insurer i think the insurer <laughs> okay the reinsurer is actually better because think about it if you're taking on risk from the insurer what would the insurer have done uh underwriting got... yes okay so do you agree if the in so for example if you're the insurer you have to underwrite your client before they become your clients Yes. But now as the reinsurer, you're going to be looking at the insurer. So they've already done underwriting. So now the reinsurer is inverted commas underwriting the insurer, which has already underwritten the risks. Yes. Okay. So is it better to be the reinsurer or the insurer? The reinsurer. It's actually better to be the reinsurer than the insurer. Okay. And do you know this guy? Which guy? No. Warren Buffett. I've heard of him. <laughs> You've heard of him? Yeah. Okay. Warren Buffett is famous for being a long-term value investor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So his company, Berkshire Hathaway, that's the company that Buffett runs. Okay. Buffett doesn't have an insurance company but he has a reinsurance company why do you think that's the case mm. it's less risky this is okay okay because do you agree providing insurance to the insurer is better than providing insurance to the actual clients yes okay because there's a level of let's say underwriting that you don't actually see okay which is actually part of the insurer's role as being the provider of cover for the insured okay the client okay okay so it's just interesting to see that someone like buffett okay warren buffett um obviously very successful investor i think he's one of the top um richest people in the world okay and his company berkshire hathaway focuses on reinsurance okay and this is a, a, a this is something that's recent okay this was um a few days ago right or a month ago about okay in 2017 this article was written by reuters okay and it showed you their expansion okay so buffett's company berkshire hathaway has a license now to write reinsurance contracts okay in malaysia okay because reinsurance is always better than insurance because it's easier or safer it's a much it's a much less risky um let's say task of of providing insurance to the insurer than it is for providing insurance to the client okay 
Exactly. Okay, and see, that's, that's smart investing. Okay, Buffett is famous for investing. Okay, you can read more about Warren Buffett. Um, there are a few books written about him. Okay, his focus is on value investing. Okay, I think maybe I'll, I'll try bringing more examples from the investment side, okay, to help you with that because, um, um, yeah, I don't think you've, yeah, you haven't done INV 2601 with me, so we wouldn't have covered those notes about this, okay, but if, if you did, then I would have covered Buffett in one of the sections, okay, portfolio management um, and value investing, Buffett focuses on that, okay, Warren Buffett is famous for value investing, so he looks for value and he looks at reducing risk, okay, that's why I'm showing you this, because reinsurance is less risky than insurance and that's why it's a better place to invest if you can in that particular area okay okay um you'll see they even talk about the the details here in terms of the amount of um the companies okay so uh b s s uh, b h s i is part of the berkshire hathaway international indemnity group of insurance companies see it's part of insurance Right, national indemnity has that amount of billion in dollars, okay, admitted assets of that in policy surplus and according to according to the BS, BHSI's website. Okay, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway is actually one of the biggest reinsurers in the world as well. Okay, Munich RE have always been big. Okay, um, let's just search for that. Let's just see what the biggest ones are currently. Uh, world's largest reinsurers 2016 let's see what are they who are the biggest um uh let's see top five non-life insurers okay swiss re let's see swiss re is also big berkshire hathaway re is also big um uh, does google not have a list let's just okay let's eliminate this normally google brings up a list okay there they do o okay no this is a bit outdated okay ranked by 2006 okay so they haven't they haven't really um, done something new then in terms of the new, like a list. I want a list, a nice list. Okay, but they're Munich RE, Munich RE, Swiss RE, Berkshire Hathaway. Okay, those are the biggest reinsurers in the world. If we look at 2016, let's go Wikipedia and see if they've got anything. Okay. Uh, the, okay, reinsurance. Yeah, there might be something here. Let's check. Is there a list? Okay, uh, Zurich Insurance. Okay, let's go to reinsurance. Okay, there they talk about facultative and treaty. Um, is there a list of the biggest? Proportional, non-proportional? Um, no, there isn't. Okay, pity. Okay, there's there's no like clear list of the biggest reinsurers in the world. Okay, but it's definitely RE. Uh, if we just type 2016 like that, okay, the same the same names come up. Okay, you've got Swiss RE, Berkshire, Hathaway, um, Munich RE. Those are the big reinsurers in the world. Okay, and, and remember, it's better to sell reinsurance than it is to sell insurance because the underwriting is part of the insurer's process. Okay, so in terms of it being safer, in inverted commas, it's a much less, uh, it's, it's less risky writing reinsurance than it is writing insurance because you've got an extra level of underwriting because the insurer has to do it as well okay okay right Melanie, let's take a quick five minute break they just do pause okay and then we'll come back and look at this next bit all right okay all right so coming back to the new set of notes support material four we're going to be looking at study unit seven now which is focusing on something completely different, which is this, claims procedures. Okay, so have you ever had a claim? Um, no, I haven't in a while, like five years. Okay, so what is a claim? So you said you haven't had a claim before. What is a claim? Um, if you've had an accident or a loss, um, then you'd have to contact your insurer and inform them of that loss and in order for you to make a claim for that loss. Good. Okay, so when do they arise? When does a claim arise? When there's loss. When there's an event that has okay. created loss, yes. Okay, so the event creates loss. Do insurers look at the loss or do they look at the event? Um, I think they would have to look at both. 
they have to look at the event that caused the loss. Yes. Because do you agree, if you've taken out insurance, you've insured your vehicle or whatever the case might be for a specific event that could give rise to a loss. Yes. So what would the claim procedure be then? Do they establish the loss or do you establish the, the event? The event, um, yeah. you'd have to contact like the claims department and you'd have to fill in a form. Yes. You have to give them information about the loss, the date, the time. You probably have to draw a diagram. Okay, so you have to give them all of that is looking at what? The procedure. Okay, what yeah. we need to do in order to get the, the loss being the, paid out. Okay, so you said you yeah. haven't claimed for a while. The last time yeah. was like, what, more than five years ago? Yeah, more than and five years. And what was the claim for? Uh, it was an accident. Okay, car accident. Uh, yes. Okay, all right, good. So you've had, you've, you've had an experience in the past um, where yeah. you have had to go through the procedure. Yes. All right, and this is what Study in Seven is focusing on. But it's not only looking at things from the client's point of view, but also from the company's point of view. All right, so we're looking at okay. both sides. Okay, so if I'm focusing on the claims department, which, uh, whose point of view? Uh, the insured. The insurer. Okay, the insurer okay. provides the claims department to the insured. Yes. Okay, the insured, which would be the client, would claim and submit documents to the claims department. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it could be for anything. It doesn't have to be an accident. It could be for trauma or burglary or any other event that has possibly given rise to a loss. Yes. Okay, so possible disagreement and controversies may arise. Do you agree? Yes. So was your claim successful? Yes, it was. Okay, did they dispute it? No, they didn't. Okay, perfect. So you had a good experience with your insurer. Insurer. Yeah, you yes. were able to submit the documents and to get paid out without too much hassle. Yes. Right, what, do the, what document provides all the detail? Uh, a claim form. Okay, the claim form is what you complete, okay, when wanting to submit a claim. But what is the document that provides the detail relating to what you are and aren't covered for? Your terms and conditions, your contract. Yes, that's important. Okay, and what is the what is insurance contract called? Um. What's it called? No idea. A policy. A policy, oh yes. <laughs> okay, All right, so an insurance contract is the policy, and do you agree there's going to be an agreement in place? Yes. And when would this agreement have been signed? On the day you would have taken out your insurance. Correct, okay, that's the date of inception when you started the contract, when the policy started. Okay, where you have to establish insurable interest and all of that, remember? Yes. Okay, so now we've got possible disagreement and controversy, controversy that can arise. Right, so mm -hmm. what is the insurer going to do? They're going to look at your policy and then they're going to look at the supporting documents. Okay, mm -hmm. which is the claim form. Right, okay. so if supporting documents is lacking, an assessor is going to be appointed. Right, what does the assessor do? What is their role? Um, they go and look at the damages or the loss that has incurred incur they investigate and they yes. will um, report back to the insurer good okay so someone needs to actually go and inspect or investigate the damages or the loss or the event that had occurred all right mm -hmm. so claims are generally communicated by phone or, or fax or email depending on what method of communication you've used right brokers what did we say their role was before we, we've seen them before what do they do? Uh, they're the communicator. Yeah, they're the middle uh, man middle. in terms of being the intermediary between the insured and the insurer. Okay, whose side is the broker on? 
Tain shard. Tain shard. Yes. The broker should be on the side of the client. Okay, so normally the broker should actually assist the client with submitting a claim and with processing yes. the claim. Because remember, the broker is the specialist. The broker should have known what product they would have sold to that particular client. Yes. Okay, so with the claims department, sometimes you deal directly with the claims department, sometimes mm. you can deal directly with the broker. Okay, so when you submitted your claim, Melanie, did you deal with the broker or did you deal with the company? Um, you deal with the broker. Okay, so you went through the broker to, to get your yes. claim submitted and, and paid yes. out? Yes. Good. Okay, so see, that's their role. Their role is to assist with that process because for them, they know what documents to submit, they know what to do because you've paid them for a contract that you've got that will cover you in the event of loss. Mm -hmm. Right, so notification of a claim must be written um, within this insurer specific period after the accident has occurred. Why is that important? You cannot claim um, after a year, it has to be done like if you're in an accident, you have to report it within 24 hours and in, inform your insurer. Why? Uh, Why is that so important? Why must notification be made in a specific period of time? Because I think uh, anything else can happen after that. Yes, exactly. Good. So do you agree? the insurer is only going to want to pay out for losses and damages that occurred from that event and not any yes. subsequent events. Yes. Okay. So if you, so for example, if you get in an accident and the front of the vehicle is damaged, mm -hmm. okay, and you don't put in a claim for that particular event and then literally a day later, you're in another accident and then the back of the vehicle is damaged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would the company cover the entire vehicle? No. Well, there are two separate events. So possibly, yes. but you would have to submit two separate claims because there separate are two claims. separate events. Yes. Okay. So yes, the, the insurer could maybe cover it, but there are two separate events creating separate loss. Okay. okay, so the focus is always on the event. What was the event that gave rise to the loss? Okay. Right, so a claim negotiator will register claims against the policy. So what details are going to be recorded? Um, the place where it occurred, the time of the loss, the description of the accident. Good. Can you think of anything else? Uh, yes, and you'd obviously need a quote, which would, um, which you would be given from your broker for li for the list of people that you can use. Okay. All right. So, do you agree? All of that will be checked or let's say confirmed against the policy. So, are they going to want to know what your policy number is? Yes. Why? Uh because they need to know the contents of that what's in that policy exactly good they need to know what is or what isn't covered before they'll even look at the claim in terms of assessing it mm -hmm. okay so before sending out an assessor to check how much the damages are in terms of the loss that you've sustained they first need to check well is this something that's included on your policy or not if okay. it's not included they're not going to bother Okay, because it needs to be something as specifically highlighted under the contract before they then process the claim any further. Right, because remember, it could be a costly exercise to get someone to go out and to assess the damages and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, so now they're not going to do all of that unless the claim is specifically part of the damages that are outlined in the contract that you've signed or agreed on. Okay. Okay. So then date of loss, which you mentioned, details of the incident, damage, and so on. Okay, those are all different things that they need to establish. Okay, so what determines the validity of a claim? Uh, 
Um, if it's uh, obviously they have to check what's in your policy to see if it's covered, what's covered or what isn't covered. Okay, what happens if it is in your policy, but you haven't paid the premium? Oh, then you won't get paid out. Okay, see, that's also a consideration. So the validity of the claim depends on whether the policy is existing and whether the policy is in force. So policy in force meaning you, you need to have paid your premium for the policy to be in force. Okay. Okay. And then they talk about this, a proximate cause. Okay, which is, which is getting more into this whole idea of cause and effect. Okay. Okay, so the insurer is going to be looking at what caused the accident. Okay, so for example, let's say you're in a hailstorm, okay, mm -hmm. and the windscreen is damaged because of the hail. Right, but now you've got car cover, all right, in terms of car insurance, but there's no cover for hail damage. Are they going to repair the vehicle? No, they wouldn't. See, because they look at the proximate cause. So all perils, covered or excluded, are specified in the contract. Okay. Insurers are liable only for the losses proximately caused by an insured peril. Okay. Insured peril means insured risk. Okay. So if you have a vehicle that is insured for fire, damage, and theft, Okay, but not for hail damage. And now it hails and your car is damaged. What is the proximate cause? The hail. The hail. Not theft or fire. So can you claim? No, you can't. Unfortunately, you can't. Okay, even though there has been damage that has been sustained to your vehicle. Okay, so do you see how the loss is very different to the event? Yes. Okay, because loss just means... I damaged my vehicle. But does the insurer care how you damaged your vehicle? No. Yes, they do. The insurer cares a lot oh, yes. about how you damaged your vehicle. Because if it was just about the damage, then they would pay you out irrespective. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, but the insurers care so much about the cause of the damage. And that's why they investigate. So, was the damage because of a hailstorm or was the damage because of an accident okay. if it's based on an accident then the loss is covered if it's based on hail and it's excluded in your contract then there's no cover mm -hmm. right even though there's still loss so does insurance always cover loss no not always okay it doesn't cover loss always because sometimes there might be a scenario where you've left out a specific event that could give rise to the loss. Okay, so do you see how tricky it gets sometimes when you're trying to claim? Melanie? Melanie, are you still there? An insurer isn't going to be focusing on the loss. The insurer is going to be focusing on the event. Yes. Okay, that's the key. Right, so we're looking at the validity of a claim and we're focusing on the claims procedure. The biggest focus for the insurer is on the actual risk that had occurred and what was the event. Okay, so they do use a case law here quite a bit because they're looking at what actually caused the damages or the loss. So what is approximate cause? Well, approximate cause means the active efficient cause that sets in motion a train of events which brings about a result without the intention of any force started and working actively from a new or independent source. See, that's important. So if you've got one event, you can't also have loss from another event, a new or independent source. Okay, so um, I think, let me just use the textbook example. In the textbook, they spoke about damages at a, um, a building, office building. And they talked about a storm, okay, that created damages in the office. So, for example, there was a storm, okay, and the storm had damaged the building, okay? Mm -hmm. And the storm, uh, I think it was a wall. The, the wall, 
The wall was damaged due to a storm. But remember, a storm is an act of God, right? Yes. Okay. And then at the same time, there was also a fire in the factory, okay, in the, in the building. Right. So there was a fire in the building which caused damages. All right. And the company had insurance for fire, okay, which damaged the building. And then a wall collapsed because of the storm. So, is the insurer going to fix the wall? No. No, they don't have to. Because yes. if they look at the proximate cause, okay, the fire had caused damage within the building, not in terms of the structure. Okay, the storm had damaged the building, which collapsed the wall. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the wall collapsed not because of the fire, the wall collapsed because of the storm. And that's the big debate that they, they discuss in terms of what are they going to pay and what aren't they going to pay. Okay. Right. And that's why sometimes cases go to court. Because you're saying, well, no, the insurer must pay for that wall that collapsed. But then the insurer can say, well, I don't. Because the proximate cause that created the wall falling was the storm, which isn't, cover un which isn't covered under your contract. Okay, so there's a very, very big debate about when insurers are going to pay out and when don't they. Do insurers want to pay out? Obviously not. Obviously not. Yeah, if they could have it their way, right, they would rather not pay out for certain claims, right, because for them, it's a loss. Every claim they pay is a loss for their business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, and that's why it can get very, very, very complicated where there can be certain, um, let's say, cases that can be opened at um, the court that will then deal with specific matters, okay, matters pertaining to a specific case. All right, so something else to consider is this, the dominant cause. Okay, so the dominant cause could be what actually created the problem. So, see, there's the note, the fire... Or the gale force wind. Okay, this was the example I was talking about earlier about what caused damages to the wall. Okay, was it the fire that damaged the wall or was it the gale force wind? Okay, cause and effect. There okay. must be a direct link between the proximate cause and the result. Right, so if the fire causes the wall to collapse, then that's the dominant cause. Okay, okay. if it's a gale force wind, then it's an act of God. Okay, so another example, dominant cause. So here's the, here's the example, Melanie. Okay, um, let's use an example of a driver that's driving a vehicle. Okay, okay, the driver of the vehicle has all the insurance in the world to cover his or her vehicle for any damages that may or may not arise. Okay, so would you like to be that person? Yes. Okay, so the driver here for the validity of the claims discussion. Okay, so imagine you're a driver who has lots and lots and lots of insurance in terms of cover for your vehicle. So if you're ever in an accident, you're covered. Mm -hmm. But here we look at the dominant cause. Okay, so now we're looking at, let's say you are in an accident. Okay, but... The accident was caused because the driver was under the influence of alcohol. So what is the dominant cause of the accident? Drinking under the influence. Drinking and driving. Is that bad? Yes. Very bad. Correct. That's against the law. So remember in a previous um, set of notes, we spoke about insurance can only be provided for events that are legal and not unlawful yes okay so if you are caught drinking and driving and you are causing an accident and your vehicle is damaged right will the insurer pay out in that particular scenario no no they can refuse to pay so long as they can prove that the dominant cause for having created the accident was drinking and driving because then that's a criminal offense and that's against the law and they don't need to fix the vehicle. They don't need to repair the vehicle. 
even though the vehicle had all the cover in the world. Okay. Okay, so you see, that's the discussion about dominant cause versus the actual loss. Okay, because anyone can be in a car accident. Yeah. Okay, as long as that car accident was due for, uh, it was due because of an accident in terms of maybe someone um, making a mistake or, 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 or it's an accident, okay, or, or damages in terms of fire or theft. Okay, let's say your vehicle is stolen. Right, in that scenario, then the dominant cause that created the damage was the actual loss in terms of maybe theft or damages or other. Okay, so the dominant cause is always what gives a direct link, okay, between the proximate cause and the result. Okay, proximate meaning it must be in relation to the actual event. Okay, proximate, close to, events that give rise to it. Okay, so here's, an, here's another example. What happens if the fire burns the building and the roof get burst into flame and then it starts, ra it starts raining and now the entire factory is wet? What was okay. the dominant cause? The fire, right? Yes. Okay, so if the fire burnt the roof and then the roof collapsed, and then rain came in and flooded the entire factory. Right, do you agree the dominant cause would have been the fire which caused all this damage, and then the proximate cause was the event, which was the fire, that also gave rise to the factory being flooded? Yes. All right, so now would the um, insurer cover all those damages? Uh, yes, they would. Yes, they would, yes. Because as long as the fire was the dominant cause, and the proximate cause was the fire that created all the other damages, then they would cover it. Yes. Okay, what happens if there's a dispute? Who needs to prove it? Um, the insured will have to prove it. Well, not always. It depends on who's making the accusation. Okay. Okay, so burden of proof would lie with the insured if they're claiming for a loss, do you agree? Yes. Okay, because you are stating something. Okay, so when you go to the claims department, you say, well, I was in an accident. I want to process a claim. So the burden of proof is with who? You or the insurer? The ins uh, with me. It's with you as the insured because you're claiming for Maybe. a particular event that you've um, had that has created loss. Okay. okay, what happens if the insurer refuses to pay out? Then who's the burden of proof with? The insurer. The insurer, exactly. So now, let's say you've submitted all your documents, okay, for the accident. And now the insurer says, no, I'm not going to pay out your claim. Right, now the burden of proof lies with the insurer because they're making the statement that they're refusing to pay. So if that's the case then they need to explain why. Right, then they need to prove that it's because of this, this, and this that they'll not pay out the claim. It's not covered under the contract. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Good. Okay. So what happens if I have terms and conditions? Does that affect the claim in any way? Yes, it will. It will always, correct. And that's why we need to read the terms and conditions very carefully because sometimes claims aren't covered because they've been excluded or taken out of the contract okay and terms and conditions give you all the detail relating to what you've got in terms of your policies cover okay for a particular loss right what is a loss adjuster we spoke about an assessor so what is an adjuster um, someone will establish value to the claim yes okay so the adjuster is looking at what is the actual let's say uh, amount okay that was that was incurred as the loss okay so the assessor will assess if you have a claim or not the okay. adjuster would adjust for the damages depending on how much of the damage has been incurred because think about this let's say I think we actually mentioned this in the previous example let's say you've got a little scratch on the vehicle Okay, from an accident. And now you want the whole vehicle to be replaced. Okay. Is that going to go through as a claim? No. 
No. Probably not. Okay, they're probably just going to repair the little scratch rather than give you a new vehicle, yes. right? Yes. Okay, so that's something to consider. So the assessment would be to assess the actual claim. But they actually, they, they, they're very closely um, related because most of the time, the assessment is probably also going to give you an amount, which is the loss of justice role. Okay. Okay, but remember, sometimes things are very specialized. Okay, remember we said mm -hmm. almost everyone can be a risk manager because you come yep. with a specific set of skills that can help you establish the loss. Yes. Okay, so the loss adjuster could maybe be the panel beater that's going to that's going to fix the scratch on the vehicle. Okay, mm -hmm. the adjuster, uh, not the adjuster, the assessor could maybe could maybe be someone from the company that goes out and actually sees, "Oh, well the vehicle is scratched and it was because of an accident." See, they're assessing okay. the actual event of the loss. Okay. Okay. And then you've got a note here about financial loss which can be broken up into two, indemnity and compensation. Okay, obviously financial loss refers to losing something that has given rise to a financial impact that's negative. Okay, so you would lose something because you're in a loss. So if your vehicle gets damaged, is there financial loss there? Yes. Yes, because the vehicle has lost worth or it's going to cost something to replace it or to fix it. Okay. All right, so the terminology used here is sum insured and limits of indemnity. Sum insured refers to what is the amount that you've been covered for, and that's established beforehand. Okay, so uh, Melanie, how much cover, or what, what is the amount of cover that you have on your vehicle? Do you know that offhand, or do you need to consult your broker? I think I'll have to consult my broker. I can't okay. remember. All right, that's interesting. Okay, so the sum <laughs> insured would be the amount. So let's say it's a million. Okay. Okay. So this would be the sum insured. And that could be for whatever. It could be for the house, the car, the... It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, but the sum insured means it's a predetermined amount of loss that the insurer has assigned to your policy as part of the damages that could arise. Okay, the limit of indemnity is the amount of loss only known after the event. Okay, so this could be, well, if you are in an accident, okay, limit of indemnity is looking at more the amount that's established after the loss has occurred. Okay, not before. Right, so before is what it, uh, it actually is in terms of the cover, and what it is after is what the damages are after. Okay, so for example, let's, let's talk about a geezer bursting. Okay, do you yeah. agree there's going to be a sum insured on the geezer actually being uh, damaged and replaced? And then the limit, the limit of indemnity could be the amount of loss that would have been sustained after the geezer had burst. Yes. Okay, so you'll know how much it costs to replace the geezer, but you won't know how much the damages are for all the water that has damaged the building. Yes, true. Sure. Okay. All right, then you've got a note here about indemnity versus compensation. Are they the same? No. No, they're very different. Okay, so what does the indemnity mean? To indemnify someone, what does that mean? Uh, it's to cover yourself against risk. It's to okay. put you back in the situation you were before the loss. Okay. Okay, compensation is just to give you a payout in terms of rands and cents. Okay, so can all perils be reduced to a monetary amount? No, it doesn't have to be monetary. Okay, no, no, it doesn't have to be monetary. It could um, be what? A repair, like, so your vehicle could be fixed. Yes. Okay, but can all perils be reduced to a monetary amount? So when I say perils, I mean like, so for example, if you lose the loved one, yes. can that be reduced to a monetary amount? No. No. Okay, you can't put a price on someone's <laughs> life. Yes. Okay, but what happens is they compensate you for the loss. Yes. Okay, so because your loved one died, and because your loved one was a breadwinner in the family, this mm -hmm. is the amount of life cover that will be paid out to the loved ones. Okay, so is life cover indemnity? 
Can you bring someone back from the dead? No. No, you can't. Okay, so that's not indemnity, that's compensation. Okay. Can all losses be fixed? No. no. You can't always fix all the losses. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't put someone back in the position they were before. Yes. Okay. So, for example, if you're in a severe car accident, and let's say um, you lose a limb, okay, you lose an arm or a leg or something like that. Okay, yes. can they put you back in the position you were before? No. No. Okay, because that's part of that's part of like disability cover now. Mm -hmm. Okay, see that's a different policy. That's disability cover. Okay, if you've got car insurance, the car insurance is going to cover the damages of the vehicle. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so what happens if we've got all, we've got the most comprehensive car insurance in the world? If we're in an accident, the vehicle will either be replaced brand new or fixed until it's perfect. Okay, versus if we're in a car accident, okay, and we're crippled by the car accident because we lose our legs. Mm -hmm. Is the car insurance going to pay us for losing our legs? No. No, the car insurance is going to pay out for replacing or repairing the vehicle. See, that's indemnity for the vehicle, but not compensation for the loss of your legs. Okay, because that's a different policy. See, that's a different claim. Now you're going to have to claim for your disability. Yes. Okay, so you could be in a scenario where you're in a car accident and you lose more than the vehicle. Okay, what you lose on top of what you lost in the vehicle in the crash is covered under a separate policy. Okay, because the policy for the car is going to be specific to damages to the vehicle. Okay, okay that, that's quite worrying, eh, if you think about it. Yes, it is. Okay, you can have all this cover for the car, and the car is, the car is like protected in inverted commas, but then your life isn't because you might not have the disability cover. True. Okay, so yes, you get a brand new vehicle, but then you're still crippled. Which is not a okay. nice thing. Pardon? Which is not a nice thing. It's not a nice thing at all. That's, that's, see, that's the difference between compensation and indemnity. Okay, so compensation could be a payout because of your disability. See, that's disability insurance or cover. Indemnity is putting you back in the position you were before. So fixing the car or repairing it or replacing it. Happy? Yes. Okay, good. Right, so here's an example of underinsurance. Okay, an average may apply if the sum insured does not cover the value of the risk. All right, so how about this, Melanie? Let's say you take out house or yeah, uh, house insurance. So you, you've covered your home. Yes. Okay, but obviously you take out insurance. Let's say you've taken out insurance five years ago. Do you think your house is still going to be worth the same now? No. No. So that's why, as part of the renewal, every year you need to check what is the value of your house. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that and you're underinsured, if you have a loss arising, can the company refuse to pay out a portion of the loss or the claim? Yes. Yes, they can. So here's the example. A house is insured for $4 million. That's the sum insured. But the actual cost of the building is $5 million. Okay, the repairs amount to a million. What is the settlement going to be? So this could be a scenario where you've insured your house for four million, but the actual market value of the house is five million. So to repair and fix the uh, the to repair and fix the house, it would amount to five million. And now you've got damages amounting to a million. How much is the insurer going to pay out? Um, I think they'll only pay out a portion of the million because. Um, your house went up by 1 million. Correct, because they're going to say you're underinsured. Okay, because they're going to say, well, you've been paying us premiums for 4 million rand cover. You weren't paying us premiums for 5 million rand cover. Yes. Do you see what the insurer is going to do? Yes. The insurer is going to say, well, I can only pay you out a portion. 
because I didn't cover your house for five, I only covered your house for four. Yeah. Good or bad? That's bad. That's bad. You're probably going to want to sue the insurer. Yes. <laughs> okay. And that's the dispute resolution that we'll discuss later on. Okay. Because now you're going to say, well, hello, I've paid you a premium to cover my house for damages. Irrespective of whether the house is worth four or the house is worth five. True. Okay. So see, you see how um, problematic insurance can become? Yes. And that's why you have so many court cases and things like that, because there's always a dispute. The insurer doesn't want to pay out more than they have to, but the insured wants to be covered for the loss. Okay, yes. so in this scenario, only 80, 800000 will be paid out because it's underinsured. See, that's the topic here, underinsurance. All right, then we had a note about betterment. We discussed it before. Can you be put in a better position than you were before? Um, yes. You can, but it's because of this, replacement values. Right, so betterment will only exist if the insured has put in a claim under a policy where you're looking more at the replacement values rather than the current market values. Okay, in terms of um, the, the carrying value of the vehicle. All right, so let's think about this. Let's say you've bought a vehicle. Is it possible to replace the vehicle for the exact same make, model, and um, mileage? No. No, you can't. Okay, it's, uh, the insurer will never be able to give you the exact same vehicle back. And let's okay. say the vehicle was in such a bad accident that it needs to be written off, and they're going to have to replace the vehicle. So now they give you a new vehicle. Obviously, that new vehicle is going to be similar, but maybe better than what you had before. So is betterment yes. possible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, but remember, insurance companies don't want to enrich people, okay, by putting them in a better position than they were before. As long as it's a similar position as they were before, then that meets the definition of insurance, not enriching anyone. So no one must make a profit from the insurance industry. That, that's, that's the base. That's the basic rule. If you're taking out a policy to be covered in the event of loss, if the loss arises, you shouldn't profit from that. That's what insurance tries to prevent. Okay. Okay. All right, then I've got a note about methods of setting claims. Okay, there's the note, ex gratia payments. We, sp me we mentioned it before. Okay, if you're a very big customer, very big client, and you have a claim for something that's not under the contract. Can they still pay it out? Um, if you have an ex gratia agreement, I think. No, the ex gratia is an agreement. You won't see ex gratia on the, on the contract. Ex gratia is something that is done out of the goodwill of the company. Okay. Okay, so here's the example, Melanie. Do you have hail cover on your car? Yes. Okay, you do. Okay, let's assume you didn't. Okay, so we know that you do have hail cover on the car, meaning if you were in a hailstorm and your car was damaged, your car will be repaired. Okay. okay, but let's assume that you didn't have the hail cover, but you've been a really good customer and you have, you've been claim free for many years and now you've got a claim arising for damages from the hailstorm. But now you realize, oh, I never had the hail covered um, as part of the contract. Okay, if, your, if the insurer was very, very kind and considerate, they could possibly still repair your vehicle. And that'll be viewed as an ex gratia payment, not a claim. Okay, isn't, will an ex gratia payment affect your claims history? Yes. No, it won't. Okay, ex gratia means it's out of the goodwill of the company. Okay, so an ex gratia payment wo won't affect your claims history because it's not considered a claim. Okay. Okay, so sometimes companies do do that for very, very valuable clients. Okay, normally big clients, like corporates maybe. Okay, possibly. If there's something missing from the contract, but they're such a big client, 
they might just pay out just because they want to keep them as a client. Okay, that's like an ex gratia payment. That's how they would view it as. The insurer would view it as an ex gratia payment. Okay, it, it, it doesn't get done often. Okay, because it could be seen as a, a, a way to commit fraud and corruption. Okay, because think about it. If you're always doing things ex gratia, then you could be paying whoever's claim just because you wanted to pay it. Sure. All right. So it's not something that should be done often, but it is something that's covered in the theory. Okay. So certain companies may provide ex gratia payments. Okay. Other methods of settling claims, replacement, repair, and reinstatement. All different ways to put you in a position you were before. Here's the note about the claims disputes. Are you always happy with your insurer? You should be. Well, you should be if they're a good insurer. If they're not, then there are going to be disputes. If disputes arise, then how do we resolve them? There are three possible remedies. The first, negotiation. So, when you have a dispute, the first place that you go is to who? your broker correct the insurer or the broker so try address the problem with the insurer or the broker before you start taking legal action okay before we go to court what should we do arbitration yes arbitration so maybe go to the ombudsman okay okay an independent party right and if they can help resolve the issue great because then you're settling it out of court Okay, if, if you still don't get any remedy, then you take it to court, and then that's litigation. All right, that's the last resort because it's the most costly. Okay, and that's the process. So it's negotiation, arbitration, and then litigation. Do you agree? Okay, an easy way to remember this is just to think about it logically. Okay, so Melanie, have you ever had a dispute at work where you weren't happy with something? Yes. Okay, then what did you do? You okay, well, what manager. was the dispute? Let's first discuss that. What was the dispute? Mm. It could have been minor, yeah. it could have been more important, but what, what was the dispute? Uh, sometimes when you don't get things done like the way you should be, yes. so, you address, so you address the issue with your manager. Okay, good. For your manager okay. to intervene. Perfect. Okay, so there, that's a good example. So the dispute is you weren't getting something um, done correctly, so you had to raise it with the manager. Okay, did you go sue the person? Um, first, you try the person, and if you don't get any res resolution, you go to your manager. Yeah, so do you see the steps are quite logical, right? So yeah. first is try and negotiate. Okay, so you probably negotiated with the person. So, so this person isn't doing what they're supposed to. You addressed it with that person. That didn't work, so then you went to the manager. That's arbitration. Because now the manager is the person that's going to help you solve the problem between you and the other person. Do you agree? Yeah. And if that still doesn't happen, then you take things to court. Um, you're breaking up. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Okay, right, now so you're fine now. Okay, so negotiation is the first step, then arbitration, then litigation. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, and then we've got a note here about prescription. Prescription is talking about how long you have to raise a complaint or a claim. Right, so notification must be prompt, okay? And it has to be written, and there needs to be some sort of um, I can't, uh, paperwork. I can't hear you. Um, let me just check here. Okay. Okay, the audio seems fine. Um, the mic. Okay. Is this right? Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, it might have been the microphone. Okay, so just try to check the microphone. Okay, so... If I'm looking at prescription, prescription is focusing on how long do you have to actually submit or to raise a claim. 
Right, so claims need to be notified and they need to be prompt. You can't wait too long before submitting a claim. Okay, okay final submission of a claim, two years or shorter. Legal proceedings, legal proceedings must be instituted timelessly. Recovery from third party, three years, which is the normal prescription period. Okay, I think this you might have covered within commercial law as well. Yes. They talk about prescription. How long do you have before something prescribes? If something prescribes, do you have a claim after the prescription period has ended? No. No, you don't. Okay, so once the time period is up, the time period is up. You can't go back and then, and then try claim from that period or from that person. Okay. Okay. Then you've got post-loss action. What must we do after the claim has been uh, made or settled? Underwriting. Okay. All right. So underwriting gets done before and even after. Okay. Okay. Because you establish the risks before, okay, the claim arises. And then you also establish the risks after because you need to decide, do I or am I still going to cover this particular client or have the risks changed? Okay. Okay. So that's called the post loss survey where a survey will be conducted to try and look at ways to improve the scenario for both parties. Okay, so let's say you, you were running a business and then you had theft. After the theft has occurred, there could be possible actions that you could do to improve your risks. And if you improve your risk, that might reduce the premiums perhaps, or still allow your insurer to cover you in the event of loss. Okay. okay. Right, you also have a no claims bonus. That's also something to consider after the claim has been settled. Okay, that can be affected as well. There could be a reinstatement of the sum insured. Okay, so sometimes um, your, your sum insured can actually deplete okay, in terms of what you've got cover for, or there could be a deletion of a specific item. Okay, pa paid out for a total loss or a write off. Okay, that's all post loss. So something that happens after the event has occurred. Okay. Right, and then the last bit, Melanie, is just something that I want you to think about. Okay, so these are two questions that I want you to think about for next week. We'll, we'll debate the answers next week. Okay, when we start the new section. The new section is looking at regulation. Right, short-term industry regulation. So two questions I want you to consider is, number one, do you think the insurance industry should be monitored? Okay, there's a lot of question marks that we can raise there in terms of yes and no. I want to hear what your view is next week, okay? okay? And then also, I want you to consider this. How does legislation affect the risk or insurance industry? Does it affect it, yes or no? And if so, how do you think it affects that industry? Either for better or for worse, depending. But we'll debate that next week. Okay. Right, and then also, if you can, try find an example of legislation that has either helped you or harmed you in the financial risk or insurance industry. Okay, we will we'll look at some other examples, but just to start the debate of next week, I'm gonna ask you for yours. Okay, your view, your examples. Okay. All right, Melody. And that covers Thanks. what we had to look at this week. Any questions? Okay, no, no questions. Okay.